today we are starting a new thing with our sermons, and uh, that is that we are going to be looking at Genesis. Now, how many of you are familiar with Genesis? One guy. One guy. Raise his hand. No, it's, I know most of you uh, are familiar somewhat with Genesis. You know some of the stories anyway. Uh, maybe even if just a little bit, but we're going to be looking at the, some of the main characters in Genesis. Uh, we're going to look at God's calling on Abraham and Sarah. Uh, they start off, of course, with Abram and Sarah as their names. We're going to look at uh, Isaac and Rebecca. We're going to look at Jacob and Leah and Rachel. All these people were called by God. Uh, sometimes it focuses on the men, but all of them were called. And so we're going to be looking at these folks. We're not, we're not looking at the whole book of the Bible. Uh, we're skipping the first section and we're skipping the last section. But we're going to look at this main part here. Uh, Genesis is a word that means beginnings. So Genesis tells the story of how Israel came to be the nation Israel. Or at least it starts the story. It actually continues. Uh, in fact, the first, the first five books of the Bible are considered to be, by the most conservative, conservative Jews in biblical times, they were considered to be their holy scriptures, uh, more authoritative than the prophets or the writings or anything else in the Old Testament. Uh, many of the most conservative Jews believed it was the first five books. And those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are considered to be the law or the Torah. It's the beginning so that how they came to be who they are. Uh, Genesis and uh, those other the other four books are said to have been put together in their final form uh, during the time of the exile. When the Israelites were exiled in Babylon, the temple and their city are completely destroyed, and people are wondering why. How could God allow this to happen to us? And as oftentimes happens when a community's uh, identity is in crisis and their future is in crisis, they want to get things organized. And so a lot of their stories and things they put together and to tell a story of how they came to be and also why God would allow this to take place. And so you can see some of that as you read through Genesis. So we're going to start with Abram and Sarai, or specifically we're focusing on Abram. And I know it's kind of a, you know, you think, well, it's Abraham, but just bear with me until we get to his name change. Abram. And we don't know a lot about him, except that we know that he is the father of the three greatest religions of the world, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. They all, we all have our roots in Abraham, in Genesis. And we don't know a lot about his background, except that his father was, we don't know if he was called by God, it doesn't say specifically, or if he just felt the itch to move, but he got up. And he left their land of Ur, and they headed towards Canaan, which would be the promised land. It had not been promised yet, but it would become the promised land. But they stopped along the way. Maybe, maybe they got worn out. You know, maybe they ran out of uh, resources to keep moving. But for whatever reason, they settled in Huron, and that was it. Then we fast forward many years. When you read the scripture, if you, you sometimes one verse to another can be many years later. And so Abram now is older, and he is called by God, it says specifically, that he's called by God to basically pick up where his father had left off. Time to finish the journey. So he's going to get up from Haran, and he's going to go the rest of the way to Canaan. That's what God calls him to do. And this is a very important foundational section of scripture, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Uh, so important that the Apostle Paul in Romans uh, references this story when he talks about Jesus being the fulfillment of this blessing of God in Genesis 12. We could also call it a covenant. What is a covenant? Well, in biblical times, a covenant was kind of like an agreement, except it was different. Uh, but it was between two parties. Uh, and the covenants in the Old Testament are somewhat modeled after covenants that were given during those times in the ancient world, in which oftentimes it was between a king and somebody of lesser power. And so in Abram's case, of course, God was the one with the most power, and Abram did not have as much power. And so in this covenant, they both agree to certain things. So God tells Abram to get up and move to the promised land. And if you obey me in this, if you are uh, trust me in this, I will bless you 
will have children. And you will have lots of children. They will have children. And the descendants will become numerous. And you will become a great nation. And through you, the entire world will be blessed. That sounds like a pretty good deal. All i got to do is move. And then God's going to do the rest. This would have been very interesting, though, for a number of reasons. This would have been difficult for Abram. Number one is that he's 75 years old. Now, not that you can't do things when you're 75, but generally speaking, when, when you get to that stage in life, you kind of tend to think about settling down, not, not uh, packing up and leaving. And here he's being called to leave everything that he knows, his land that he spent a good portion of his life in, and he's being called to move to an unknown place. And this is really unknown. It's not as though he can Google the population of Canaan and what kind of people live there and things like that. Now, he can't do any of that. And so he has very, very little clue of where he's going to other than what he's maybe heard from word of mouth. So this is a very difficult journey because, number one, he's 75 and he's being promised children. Now, that's going to take an extreme amount of faith, right? He and his wife have not been able to have children. This is a familiar story we see in the Bible many times. But the faith involved in believing that that could happen is actually true. I mean, how many of you who are 70 and up have children on your radar? None of you, right? Probably. <laughs> not really. Usually that's not on your radar. Well, Abram and Sarai are having to have an extreme amount of faith to believe that God would provide them with children at this point. I mean, for them, it actually, they would have been happy. Because, you know, for some people at that age, you'd be like, what? But for them, they would have been happy because children were seen, of course, and they are now too, but they were seen as a blessing for many different reasons. And uh, especially living on the family name was very important. And so they had to believe that. That was hard. They had to move. That was difficult. But one thing we learn from this story is that sometimes God's greatest calling in a person's life is after they retire. You know, you think about the number of biblical figures who are past the age of retirement when their story starts in the Bible. It's really quite interesting. And I know that retirement wasn't a thing back then. You know, that's something that's relatively recent in human history. But nonetheless, they were to the age to where they could have been retired if they lived today. And, you know, if you are nearing the age of retirement, or perhaps you are in retirement, uh, I know that sometimes we retire not only from our jobs, but sometimes we tend to think, well, I'm done with this and that and that, and, and I really need to step back so the younger generation can take charge as though there isn't enough room in the church for young and old to serve God. Uh, but, you know, we tend to think, well, now it's time to just kind of sit and wait. And that's a bad, number one, that's always a bad philosophy to just, I'm just going to do nothing the rest of my life. But secondly, God might be calling you in this stage in your life to something else. God, your greatest work might be after you've retired. Have you ever thought about that? Generally, we don't think about life that way. We think that, okay, we're done in retirement. But so often, God calls people in post-retirement years to do amazing things in the Bible. And in fact, for many people, their retirement years are the best time to uh, fulfill a calling or a passion that they've had because they have more flexibility and because they have more time than they did at any other stage in their life. That they are able to do things that they couldn't do before. You know, I've heard numerous people who are retired say, I don't know how I ever have time to do anything. I'm more busy now than I was when I was working. And the reason for that is oftentimes because that person is volunteering here, they're volunteering at their church, they're volunteering in the community, they're doing all these things, they're giving, and so they are, in a way, living their life in a way that was never possible before they retired. And so I'd just like you to keep that in mind. If you're nearing retirement or you are retired, keep in mind God's not done with you yet just because you're retired. And God may be calling you to your greatest work yet. But that would have been one reason this call would have been hard, was because of Abram and Sarai's age. The second reason this would have been hard is because they were being called to leave the familiar and go to the unknown. They were being called to move. They were being called to change. Or as we say in the sermon title, they were being called to leave. Uh, this is something that I'm quite familiar with as a pastor, as 
as I move at the call of the bishop. But maybe some of you are feeling called to move, to leave, to pick up roots and, and go to an unfamiliar place. Or maybe for you it's not moving, but perhaps it's something else. And as a pastor, I can't help but think of the church. As we know that the world has changed. You know, it's interesting. The older we get, the harder change becomes. That's just natural. The harder change becomes. We want to, we want to kind of be able to settle down a little bit and to be able to relax in familiarity. And no more is that more so than in the church. Uh, we have sacred traditions. We have methods and ministries that have become sacred to us because we go through very special moments in our lives, pivotal moments in our lives. Maybe it was a baptism. Maybe it was a wedding. Maybe it was a funeral. And uh, we go through these times in our lives, joyous and solemn, and it connects those ministries and methods, and, and it becomes very sacred to us, becomes spiritual. And yet we know, too, that some of the same methods and ministries that may have been effective in past generations may not be as effective now. If it feels like as you get older, the world is changing faster, sometimes you may wonder if that's just perception. It's not. It's objective. It's objective reality. You know, there's been studies done on this. The world is changing faster and faster in the past 80 years than at any time in the history of the world. And so that can be unsettling in and of itself. But as we look at the idea that the church also has to be adaptive to be able to continue to make disciples, to be willing to change methods, to ch do, try new ministries, uh, to make disciples while keeping that same gospel message, that can be unsettling to us. But not just as a church individually. Change can be unsettling. Whether you're being called to move or maybe you're not being called to move, but you're being called to change a career. That can be hard. That can be scary. Or maybe you're being called to do something new and it may not be your job, but it might still be kind of scary to do. Or it might be that for you, change was thrust upon you. It was not a calling of God. It was not even welcome. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. It was unwelcome. It was unwanted. But here you are, seeking to redefine your life and to find meaning in this new stage of life that you find yourself in. Remember, God may be calling you to your greatest work yet. But moving to the unfamiliar, dealing with change, is very difficult. Because there's always a period of chaos in the middle. You know? Abram is leaving Haran, but he's not going to get to Canaan the next day. Right? And even when he does, he doesn't know what it's going to be like. So there's this period in the middle with chaos and unknown, and that's scary. And it's hard for us to go through. We don't like to do it either. We want to know all the answers, right? We want to know all the answers. But we can't always know the answers sometimes. Sometimes we have to go with what we know and just go from there. See, Abram, when he heard from God, we don't know Abram's background, but chances are it's very possible that his family believed in many gods. Because remember, Judaism was not a thing yet. Uh, polytheism, the belief in many different gods in the world, was the most prevalent in the world. Monotheism, the belief in one god over everything, was pretty new. And so chances are that Abram believed in many gods at this point in his life. And so he would have been following a call from this new god that he doesn't really know very well. He's just getting to know. And it's, it's not like God just downloaded a bunch of theology into his head so he understood everything <clears throat> at once. Abram, during his journey, he is going to have to unlearn some things that he thought he knew about how God works. And he was going to have to relearn how it is that God works. He's going to have to break some of his old assumptions and form some new ones. Uh, which makes more sense, you know, when we think about the story down the road about when he almost sacrifices his son Isaac. And we think, is this guy mad? Is he crazy? Uh, but it makes sense in the context of an ancient world where you might have grown up believing in many gods and that perhaps some of these gods required human sacrifice. And God is teaching him 
hey, guess what? I will never ask for a human sacrifice from you. Never. And it makes a little bit more sense. It's just very ancient, so it kind of offensive to sometimes to our modern sensibilities. But it makes sense as he is unlearning some of the things that he might have grown up with, and he's learning who the true God is and what God is like. And so the same thing happens to us when we deal with change in life, is that sometimes we have to unlearn some of our assumptions about the way world, the world works, and we have to learn some new assumptions or, or hear some new lessons. And the tempting thing is that if we feel a call of God in our lives and it's to something unfamiliar, the tempting thing is to wait until we have all the answers before we take that step. But I would like to encourage you that if you feel called by God to do something, don't wait until you have all the answers. Take a step of faith. There is something to be said for planning, but planning can only get you so far. And eventually you have to take a step in faith. If Abram had waited until he knew all the answers, he never would have left her own. And God would have probably had to have called someone else. But Abram believed in God, as, as Paul says. Abram, Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He trusted in God, he had faith in God, and he would continue to learn more about who this God was. As he would eventually learn that this is the God of heaven. That God created the entire world. But it took a while to get there. It took a while to get to the to Canaan. It took a while to, to get to the other side before he had to live in this period of chaos. And so I, I just want to encourage you. Maybe you're feeling called by God to do something new and it's scary. Or maybe you're not being called but change is thrust upon you. And that is scary. And you're living in a period of chaos right now. I would like to encourage you to know that even though you don't know all the answers and you don't know what next year is going to look like, know that God is with you. And sometimes that has to be enough. Sometimes that is enough. That God gives us enough to take the next step. I like what it says in the prayer of confession. Lord, help me to live today. I don't have to figure out how to live next year right now. <laughs> I just have to figure out how to live today. Uh, so may we do that. May we follow God. May we trust in God in the midst of change, in the midst of chaos, knowing that God will lead us to the promised land.